I asked Grandad if he had resented the system, and even more so, the brutish environment that was not due to the fault of his own. As a twenty-something, when I look at stories and archives from the past, I just often feel like I cannot connect to that part of China and how it was and what it was. As China's influence grows more prominent these days, I find myself worrying about the problem of self-definition. What is mainland Chinese? What is it about our collective experience that made us who we are? How has the founding of the PRC shaped our narrative and relationship with the world? These will be the questions that will haunt us for years to come. This time, I'm driving a thousand kilometers from Guangdong to Wuhan to find my answers from a special someone with a unique take on China. It is always nice to see more of this country, and I can't wait to take you with me. A charming thing about Wuhan is that a hearty breakfast never has to be somewhere fancy. You only need to pay one dollar here for a hot steamy bowl of wonton, freshly made as you order, ready to go. I'm having you tell this time, which is a kind of deep fried dough commonly seen in Chinese household. With soy milk. Well, my nan likes her Wuhan rice donuts, because she's the local here. It's taken me years of traveling to Wuhan to finally get a good handle of these hot dry noodles. It's taken me roughly the same amount of time to realize someone in the family has witnessed China's entire progression since 1949. <laughs> <laughs> yep, this is Grandad. He was just being modest then. Grandad always makes things on his own. He made everything in his house. When I broke into his balcony this summer, I found out he has been making walking canes with these gorgeous lifelike snakes and dragons on them. One for him, one for grandma, the other ones are just for fun. It dawned on me that the beautiful furniture that quietly appeared over the last decade, these wooden panels behind the TV, the decoration on the wall, the giant antique shelf and the carved windows with the blessings of Chinese characters. Oh, do I even want to mention the flower stand and other bits and bobs? They all came from Grandad, shall I say, a man of craft and ingenuity. But Grandad wasn't really a carpenter by trade. He spent his entire life as a mechanical engineer making tools for Chinese farmers and was the first group of people sent to Africa on China's foreign aid programs after China opened doors in 1978. Grandad just turned 90, and among these 90 years, there were 64 he spent as a member of the party. Yeah, that party. But to me, it was more than that. His life story reflected precisely a part of that Chinese experience that most people including myself, have struggled to understand. Grandfather was born to a poor peasant family in 1934. In 1934, China was fighting off the Japanese. That was 12 years before the Communist Party of China and Kuomintang broke with the Union in the Civil War. 15 years before the CPC won and founded the People's Republic in 1949. Having drawn support from the peasantry and the working class, the party established authority that claimed to serve the poor for the poor. 1949 wasn't celebrated by all, but for someone like my grandfather, it was a year that marks the beginning of a time that will uplift the entire trajectory of his life. To mobilize nation building, the party launched a few campaigns. One was the land reform. By 1952, more than 80% of the Chinese population was peasantry. 
These people owned little to no land and were under the economic subjugation of the minority landlord controlling most power and resources. To even out the land ownership, the party confiscated landlord's property to give to peasants and permanently abolished land rent. The other was the three and five anti-movement, an act of class war aiming as an all-out assault on landlords and businesses. During Mao's era, class struggle had become an important vocabulary of Chinese society. Mao believed that a protracted war between the working class peasant and the feudal upper middle class was the path to a successful socialist revolution. To be accurate, my family experienced both the good and the bad. The property of my grandmother's family, a well-off landlord with a home big enough to house a school, was taken away. Meanwhile, my grandfather received opportunities for care and betterment. <laughs> He went to Hubei Revolution University for further education to study the Marxist theory so he could become a competent leader for the new China. He graduated in 1952 and was allocated to a state farm in Jinmen, Hubei province, to train as a mechanical engineer. The government also gave his family one acre of land. Once there, he would be spending the next 30 years of his life working to the needs of China's planned economy. In exchange, the party would provide him with social security and better opportunities for career advancement. Or so he was told. He joined the party in 1961, at the age of 26, along with 170 million other people. During my stay there, I took Grandad back to that farm to catch a glimpse of the 1950s China and the physical environments that represented China's drastic change from past to present. The old farm only reminded me of the things that we desperately want to leave behind. Backwardness, poverty, deprivation of knowledge, a lack of choice. But for Grandad, the farm was the place where he earned his title and a lifetime of honor and security. This, to me, represents the heart of the China miracle everyone talks about. That the transformation to wealth and affluence really happened within less than three generations. Love the Yangtze River. Look at this baby. 
honest, making videos about China is is hard. In the sense that China is such a big topic and every generation and every decade represent a different facet of China. And so you are ultimately limited by what you know and your perspective. As a 20-something, when I look at stories and archives from the past, I just often feel like I cannot connect to that part of China and how it was and what it was. And that's why I think that I wanted to talk to my grandfather and ask him what he saw as a young person back in the 1950s and 1960s and all the turmoils and difficulties that he had been through as a Chinese person. Grandfather's party membership had not protected him from the biggest trauma he was about to face. It wasn't until 1961 before the Great Famine had finally taken its toll on my family. We were the village of the village. We had a lot of fish. 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 吃了个鱼塘，鱼塘以后呢，我就弄弄安排一间房子。所以说，当第二天，隔壁的家人家就跟我说：“说你妈，你妈，你妈妈昨天晚上很累哟，在屋里很，嗯嗯，就是很，就是人不舒服，就很累哟。晚上，我我的我就早上跑去看他，已经就病了，就病了。吃了那个好长时间没有吃那东西，一吃了以后呢，我也受不了。”现在，黄大仙的感染，黄大仙的感染，那不行了，人家不行了，面你面色皮肤啊肉啊，全部成黄色的了，全部黄色的后，就是医院里就是，这人呢就是年纪大了，现在身体太虚弱了，但是现在继续可以治的，那个时候继续不行。就是这，等我等我再来，他来一直到走，一直到去世，就这么过程几天，几天的时间。就是这么这么多事情发生，你当时是什么？那我没发生，没发生啊，哎过了好多年以后，慢慢的才好。I asked Granddad if he had resented the system, and even more so, the British environment that was not due to the fault of his own. 狗不嫌家贫，日不嫌母丑，天灾人祸，大环境，大的政治环境，国家的整个大环境都是那样。还有比我母亲年纪小的、年轻的，很多很多牵挂，到处都是的，到处都是，没有什么其他的办法。个人是无力，无力回天。当时我们那个政治、政治、政治局、政治这个小局，还没得，没得今天这那个水平。当时就跟着大，看到这个大形势，就像年轻人的思想，他比较适应当时的。啊，不像现在个你政治不成熟。你看现在我们觉得回回想那个时候，分析那个时候，天灾人祸
超程的，这我已经说是绝大部分超程的，这是我们现在来分析，当时你没得这个认识，当时你没得这个认识。I was looking for some kind of reassurance about China's past, but as I listened, I realized there was little about his life that was political. It was simply a life where you have to accept where you were, strive to make the most. And to find internal resolutions in situations that you were never able to control. This is the past Communist era, the Communist Communist era. This is the two votes, two votes in the two votes. Only in the two votes in the two votes. In the whole country, it can be used. 计划经济的时候，就实现这个国家粮食紧紧张，不是粮食，不是很多，不是随便买得到，非拿这个票，国家分你一个月三十斤粮食，国家就给三十斤票的你，你就拿这三十斤票，在两店里可以买三十斤粮食，你没有这个东西，两店里就不卖给你，什么东西都是票，肉票、布票，还有油票，这里有石油、油票。这个，你买个自行车也要票，自行车票，买个手表也要票。当时这个东西粮票那是这是保命的东西啊，没得粮票你就买不到米粮食，你就没饭吃啊。人民币呢？你钱再多也不行的，不是像现在可以用高价，那不行的。These stamps were the last memory in my family before China saw the dawn of a new era. The rest of the story happened quickly, in a blink of an eye, like a blur of happy dreams. In 1978, China embraced the market economy under Deng. In the 1980s, Grandad went to Congo to help the Africans. And when he returned home, Dad was already watching color television and buying his first Nikon camera. In Africa, a foreign businessman was impressed with his work and offered him an opportunity to trade overseas with more money. With this opportunity, he could travel more extensively across Africa, or maybe move to France. He told me that he wanted to go, but he said no. That you, why? 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 绝对不可能的，因为我的这个根据我的这个出生，我的成长，决定了我不可能有那种思想。我是在共产党的教育下，慢慢的成长起来的。共产党解放了中国以后，对我们这个像我们这个这个阶阶层的人来说，我对共产党有恩。共产党解放了我们，不是共产党解放我们要受苦。我事先脑脑子里面的这已经已经凝固了这种概这种观念概念，真的概念，我相信共产党，我不对其他的资本主义，因为在国内很多宣传的，我不相信他。这个是党员的身份，为党工作，为国家工作，我一生就是这么个概念。对，当然了，这中间也不能说没有自己的这个私人想法，总想把自己生活过过好的，工资高。待遇高一点的，这这每个人都都有的，每个人都有的。I know Granddad doesn't have the most reflective language, but it applies to some that the fate of a man is bound up with the fate of his country. You've seen much of its worst, but you also won't forget the days when the silver lining is just right at the edge. Then your life would have been so intertwined with them that you realize there's no better place to exist than the place that mucked you up. But also made you who you are. That 奶奶先吃一点，我先喝点汤。回去就没有藕，回去我们很少，也不是经常煲藕汤。你回去就没有这个藕汤，而你给我煲的最好。洗个饺子蛮好吃。嗯。到三十岁找对象，相比较而言，比这个二十几岁、二十四五岁找对象，那个困难程度加大了，你知不知道？
the Kunnans and the Jadala. But our life is also like everyone else's. The fact that I'm still single in my mid twenties, walking on a pair of itchy feet, has greatly worried my grandfather. <咳>在他们好过你呢我心里的幸福就是这样你们这一代人的我们过去都不说了像你们这一代人有一个稳定的工作有房子有一个家生活过得很幸福这就是我们理想的希望的希望我们的子孙都过得好我们我们理想的 pursuit of wealth and happiness somehow it always comes back to this I will have my own path to follow that is probably another thing I'm learning from China <laughs>